We're going to talk about your paintings. You have a show coming up at Jan Murphy Gallery. I do. And that's called Glass Psyche. Yes. Uh, um, your paintings, I think, have a, have a fairly dreamy quality to them. And I sometimes think that painting is to pho photography what dreams are to reality in a, in a certain way. And, and to extend that analogy to your paintings, um, dreams can be lucid and they can be colourful and sharply in focus or they can be quite murky and obscure and uncertain. And um, what, what dreams have and what your paintings have is a fundamental kind of strangeness to them, I think. Oh, that's would, good, would you yeah. think that's <laughs> I why, think, why do you think that, um, what, do you, what attracts you to that sort of sensibility? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think I've always had a, a strong interest in film and literature and just lots of different um, visual media. And I find that um, I'm just drawn to certain things as you are. I think it's a personality-based thing when you're drawn to, you know, let's say certain films or directors and... And art, and um, I, I feel like it's an the language that you create in your paintings is an accumulation of everything that you've ever kind of loved or desired to to make into imagery. So in terms of dream, I mean it's hard. Dreamlike is is a difficult one, and I've also heard someone describe my work in terms of magical realism, um, and I think. It's kind of hard to explain what a dream is yeah, if, if you're really being literal because dream. It. But the murkiness, I think, could also relate to memory, fragmented memory. I mean, everything that's in the past before now is, is only going to exist for us in memory. So it's all about perception and um, I think, yeah, there's something about fragmentation um, that I'm really interested in and in the idea of... Not, not being able to see the full picture, perhaps, in, in terms of the, the murkiness. You know. In an yeah. existential sense, we can only see kind of glimpses of... And not being too, too literal or too clear, because anyone can do that. And I think, I mean, it, art needs to pose a question, not create answers. And that, that's yeah. what art is meant to do in, in my mind. But then that's, that could be on different... Um, interpreted in different ways. So, um, yeah. Well, that's that kind of uh, leads on to another thought. I thought was, uh, another thought about your paintings is that they seem sometimes to be like scenes from a from a bigger narrative, perhaps. So the, viewer, yeah. the viewer doesn't really can't really get any insight into what that narrative is. They they just have to wonder what's going on rather than know yeah. what's going on. And um, I I think maybe that's the source of fascination with certain with with great art is not knowing what's going on but mm. but having something that compels you to wonder the mystery and it, yeah i mean you you hear people people who collect art i don't know if you but they often say something along the lines of, of i feel like i could look at it forever or i feel that it's always got something else to give me and that's i mean as an artist it's kind of a hard um, thing to to aim to do absolutely but I can kind of, if you look at it from a collective type of perspective in artworks that you might have in your collection, you probably find that the ones that are too kind of obvious, they won't keep you looking back into them and... and um, no. Yeah. It's They're like a perpetual motion machine if they can come up with... if they can um, look new to you every day. If they, yeah. If, if you can go off and see a movie and then come back and look at that artwork with a it might change your perspective on it or something. Yeah, and I'm not sure how artists achieve that. You know that you want to, and I think you somehow you know when something's working and when it's not, and there are a number of um, processes to go through. Do you, I might. <laughs> the cat's great. No, no. Oh, she, she wants attention. She's sorry. an actor. <laughs> um, <coughs> um, your paintings obviously draw on, on photographic sources. Um, yeah. Can you tell me how you go about finding the imagery? Sure. Um, I used to probably exclusively take my own photos um, and work from them. And this is before, certainly before I had Photoshop um, and it was on film. So I had to rely on my imagination and really work with photos that were 
at times kind of not what I wanted them to be. And um, I still work with some photographs that I take myself, but increasingly I've really um, been much more excited about found imagery. And I collect, um, I just, I have a massive collection of vintage journals, everything from National Geographic to, to a lot of men's magazines. Um, I also have beauty, Australian beauty magazines from the 80s. I have uh, many books on Australia, the ones that you find at op shops, you know, that they're sort of everywhere. I just collect um, as many things as I can and, and go through and find things that I find of interest. The, the long answer <laughs> or the mm. process is that um, I scan a lot of images into the computer and then I play with them in Photoshop. And then in the last probably two years that's been extended into printing those out and cutting them up and making collages. So that's what I've done with this body right. of work. Well, yeah, the new, the new so it's series. kind of, I keep finding new ways to use found imagery and it's making more sense for me now because I never really wanted to find an existing image and just replicate it. It just didn't, I mean, I think there are artists who can do that and maybe bring something to them. But I was looking for source imagery and with a nostalgic feel because I'm just a real sucker for nostalgia and, and just for a certain type of print quality or a certain type of So what, can image. you tell me what nostalgia means to you in, in this um, sense? Yeah, sure. Um, most of my interest probably comes from just about anywhere in the 20th century. Um, for me it means, uh, the meaning of nostalgia is like being homesick or, you know, being, mm -hmm. wishing for another time, or a time that's passed that you can never go back to. I found so do, you, do you wish for another time or do you well, wish no, for I know to that break down time so that all times can kind of coexist? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I don't, I think it's like you have an idealised version of a period of time and that if someone was to transport you back there you might uh, find out that life isn't as easy as, sure. or you know, there's they that. They don't have antibiotics, for example. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, yeah, you could die of the plague or something. But, you know, I think the... Um, Guess what's interesting to me, and I have realised that there's that the 20th century itself is such an amazing pocket of time, mm -hmm. and there was so much self-referencing going on with um, just everything, fashion and, and things like that. So you could, you know, for example, women's fashion in the 1970s um, sometimes refer you know we're drawing from the 1930s. So when you go back to different uh, periods, they're also reminding you of earlier periods. So with this body of work, I have some imagery that's taken from the 70s, but then I was also interested in the idea of Victorian postcards and the very handmade, you know, early Victorian postcards um, were often used collage and things like that. And funnily enough, I found that some imagery that I have from the 70s, when put in a collage, thing, were, it suddenly could have been anywhere. So it wasn't necessarily dated as the 70s. And when you're talking about merging times, I think that's what I am kind of trying to do. Not, mm. not nostalgia as in I must go back, but I have this fascination with so many um, periods, probably because I'm you know, born in the late 20th century and you, your parents were, you know, kind of, hanging out in the 60s and you have photos of them and you I always had a nostalgia for my parents yeah. time for some re I guess it was in my earliest memories and just what was what was around um, my parents were really into fashion you know for a time and uh -huh. and they just I mean we when I grew up we just had the craziest wallpaper and you know the curtains you know the 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 70s stuff and I think it's sort of informed an interest for me in the past, I guess. Um, as we move further and further away from that, I just keep going back. Right. <laughs> some, well, some of them are kind of uh, they, the, the collage aspect of them as their heads that are, look like they're stuck onto a, a landscape, and um, the landscape could be completely timeless. There's no yes. There's no indication of when that landscape is. Yeah, that's right. And so that that distorts that that temporal perspective even further. 
Yeah, and I hope that works. I really wanted to return to the landscape without having to just have the traditional um, or have the landscape on its own. I wanted to be able to merge it, which is why I played with the collages. Um, but that's true, they are timeless. So uh, it's, yeah, I feel like I've got more to do with it, but it's been an interesting um, exploration because the work I did last year was the first time I really used collage. I didn't do, I didn't use any environments or landscapes. It was all figurative, so. Uh -huh. And where does, the, where does the landscape stuff from this show come from? You talked a lot about the fashion. Actually, a variety um, of sources. There's one image I've used a couple of times, which, funnily enough, is from a photo taken at the Botanic Gardens in Victoria, but I took the photo about 10 years ago. In the lake, with the yeah. reflections, is that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I could easily just go there and take a new mm. photo. I don't well, know. It's a beautiful place. It's that's <laughs> laziness. But for some reason, I'd scanned in this photo a long time ago, and um, I just started playing with the colours, and um, it just came about. So, um, for example, I had last year I was using a lot of crystals to cover faces and do things with, and I, when you use collage, you're left with a lot of scraps and the negative space around the uh, one of the big crystals. I became like a, a lovely frame right. and so I would then stick that on top of various you know images of landscapes that I had and that one I had carried that around for a while thinking that it reminded me of a I had a Victorian postcard that it's actually gold edged but it's a, a wide oval uh -huh. um, with a seascape in it and I think it was just a sort of trigger of hey this is a way I can start using the negative space of these crystals to make um, these kind of portholes or little, yeah. yeah. But that gets back to the strangeness in the work, doesn't it? Because they're not they're not a neat so. frame, are they? Because they're, yeah. they're and they're, pictorially it's an they're, they're a bit strange. Yeah, because some of the some of the heads look like they're stuck on the landscape, and then the, there's other landscapes that look like they're behind something else. And yeah, is that, is that an intuitive sort of thing? It that, totally as you're is. Playing with the, it, the it, subject matter, you come it across is. that. Um, this is the thing that I love about collage is that it's highly intuitive and you can use the subconscious to to trigger things and it's it's really enjoyable so you can kind of play for hours and when a, an image that really strikes you happens it could happen really quickly and you haven't really made much effort or you can try really hard to make something you think might work and it just doesn't so I've found that um, I, I really enjoy the process. It's just quite time consuming. So it just, you could lose a lot of hours in it. So it's just a matter of, um, yeah, how much time you can <laughs> spend on that. Um, and I had. Painting's a very time consuming. Yes, process you've, got to, in general, isn't it? you've got to kind of realise that paintings need to be done. Um, but I'd like more time to play around with that. Um, Incredibly um, intuitive, and there's something to that. I think we try so hard to make something work or make sense, and when I don't know if it's a left brain thing or that other bit of your brain that operates while you're painting, you know, how you don't kind of don't know you're doing it. <laughs> it's like <laughs> I don't know which bit, it's sort of a it, there's some unconscious stuff there, too, and I think that that's. It's really interesting how much is going on that you're not thinking yeah. that you're conscious well, you of. you have to get out of your own way a lot of the time, I think. Yeah. I think, I think deep down you know what, what's good, what's, what's working and what isn't. And, and sometimes there's perhaps the analytical side of your brain is yes. getting too bogged down in detail when you know, yeah, because some fundamental painting part of your brain knows what, exactly what it's doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you... <coughs> You have a visual language, you understand how to read images and that words are not going to translate that particular language and this is what I find in whether it's going through vintage you know, publications and it's making an assessment on not just how something could work in a painting but how something could be built around for narrative. and. Um, yeah, I do. <laughs> cat's playing with the camera. <laughs> yes, yeah, and I uh, didn't mean to, she know. needs entertainment. <laughs>
Um, no, ex yes. No, and no, so exactly, I, yeah. I love the visual language and I, uh, yeah, there's, it, you could almost get lost in it. Yeah, absolutely. It's harder to talk about. But. It's very difficult to talk about and um, it's important to try, but it's much more important, I think, for us to make the images. Yeah. yeah. Um, and one of the words, I guess, that would be bandied about in relation to this work would be surrealism or, or symbolism, that sort of thing. Sure, Do yeah. You, I don't mind what, what do you think? that. <laughs> I actually I don't mean, mind it. Because uh, yeah. strange looking images, uh, you know, they, they predate surrealism by centuries. So. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I was always a fan of the symbolists too. Like, so, I mean, some of them are overly romantic, but there's some really incredible works from that um, period. Um, surrealism is something that I'm not sure if you had the same experience that it, it's like teenagers at school love it and they yeah. love Dali and they and you you force it away from yourself because you just think oh this this is um too not easy I know they're quite strange images but there were there were some really obvious ones that became uh, just a bit cheesy or something and hmm. then you, if you there's go and read there's a literal surrealism and then there's the really good surrealism. yes there's these amazing yeah. Collages. And the, I love the sculpture. I think is my favourite in surrealism. Um, I've had a book called Women Artists of the Surrealist Movement oh, yeah. since I was at art school, and I can still pick that up and find these really interesting, um, weird things. Um, there was a great surrealist filmmaker whose name escapes me right now. A great film, Shadows of the Afternoon. Do you know that? Right. I, it's not uh, ringing a bell. Would it be? I can't think of her name, but. but I've yeah, there's some, uh, there's some maybe. wonderful surreal stuff. Have. But I just wondered whether whether you thought that that was appropriate for your work to be called. Only now surrealism. with the with the collage. I don't think in the previous bodies of work. Um, one of the pieces I have has this extended arm that's just kind of stuck yes, on. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And even when I had was painting that, I thought of Magritte and you know his pipe or, or any the these odd things. He's a great example yeah, yeah. of a surrealist this you know it can be quite um almost cartoony in, in the figures but they're I, I think even in a nostalgic way now they're kind of just beautiful things you know these sort of strange little worlds um yeah he he balances it really nicely i mean i'm not um i'm not a fan of dali at all and, no, and there's I not still that struggle. big a difference between yeah. Dali and Magritte, but Magritte I is, think it's the naive. Yeah. Because Dali wasn't really naive. He was overly intellectualising well, what he was doing and very Freudian technically. Probably. That was probably the main thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, yeah, there's, uh, do you know Merritt Oppenheim? She mm. did, yeah, she did the teacup with the fur, mm -hmm. and th things like that. I just find still really exciting. Um, and yes, yeah, so the more obscure things, um, I'm interested in Hans Bellmer too. I'm not sure if he's called a surrealist. He, he turns up in surrealist books, but I don't think he was part of the, you know, the group. Yeah. 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 yeah, prob yeah. So there's that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the members, there was some specific members. So there are people who've probably been calling themselves surrealists before and after then, who uh, really depends how you look at the, um, the movement, whether you yeah. think that that... Well, another, yeah. another thing about your work is that it's kind of dark and, and, and moody, I suppose, and, um, and that's another sort of tradition, a particularly Melbourne tradition. <laughs> you might say there's lots of artists like Clarice Beckett and Peter Booth and Louise Hearman and Phil yeah, Anson and that sort of thing. That's true, yeah, 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 some of my favourites, all of those, yeah. yeah. Um, and you've got music. I mean, yeah. Got you free and all that sort of thing. Um, why do you think this stuff comes out of Melbourne? <laughs> I've never lived anywhere else. Um, I I don't uh, so it's hard for me to gauge. But um, yes, I, I've certainly always loved you know Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds and everyone associated with that. Roland Howard and um, and even you know the early punk scene and there, there's a lot of exciting things actually have come out of Melbourne. Um, I don't know. I mean, the weather is atrocious. <laughs> <laughs> I, today. It's really inconsistent. There isn't a sense of, I mean, if you go to Brisbane or there's this sense of just every day's a holiday. And yeah. um, 
I think maybe we have a strong work ethic too because we can't always go out and play. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I've, I've just had a sensibility towards certain darker things since I was probably a teenager. It was probably Twin Peaks just ruined me yeah. when I was at school. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was an extraordinary, um, extraordinary thing when that came out. Yeah, and to be a teenager and kind of, I watched every episode as it came on telly, um, and I think I taped some of them, but um, it was, it, I think it really has stayed with me um, in terms of a really... The strangeness. Yeah, the yeah and, and a visual language and a, a just an understanding that, you know, strangeness is is there and it can be interesting and... Um, yeah. Oh, um, I read something, <laughs> speaking of you being a teenager, I read something about your grandmother offered you $100 to paint something nice. Oh, yes. <laughs> did you do it? She did. I think she did said... Did you paint something no, nice? No, I couldn't. <laughs> I would now. If she was still alive, I'd probably go, sure, no, no, no problem. Because she, I, you know, she was such a great person in my life. But... Um, I felt very rebellious and I remember giving her as a birthday card this ink drawing of a like a cockroach. It was really dark and nasty. <laughs> and she she framed it and put it on her wall just I'm sure she hated it. 